This next CSS property blew my mind when I discovered it because I really thought it was something only available in JavaScript. Welcome back to Web Dev Simplified. My name is Kyle and my job is to simplify the web for you so you can start building your dream project sooner. And one way I want to help you with that is a free CSS selector cheat sheet I have linked down in the description below, covers every CSS selector that you need to know and explains exactly what they do. And if you download that cheat sheet now, I might also throw in a bonus cheat sheet for you, so make sure you check that out. Now the very first CSS property that I want to cover in this video is one that is really useful for doing things that you traditionally could only do with JavaScript. So take for example this HTML code. We have this simple button that says hover me, and it should display this text tooltip text. And this is something you would think that you would need JavaScript for, but you can actually do this entirely with just CSS. So let's come in here and we're going to select our data tooltip attribute. And again, this is one of those CSS selectors that you're going to see in that cheat sheet, one that you don't see very often, but is incredibly useful being able to select data attributes like this. And then we also want to select in here, the data tooltip, and we're going to get the before property, just like that. And this is because we want to be able to dynamically insert this text tooltip text into our screen and using a before pseudo element is the perfect way to do that. So we can just come in here and say content. And you know, normally we would have to set this to some kind of predefined string. And if we save, you can see that that string is showing up, but we want it to be this data tooltip right here. So we can use a property in CSS called ATTR. This is a function and all you do is pass it in the attribute you want to get. So, you know, you could do like the title attribute. In our case, we want the data tooltip attribute. Now, if we say that you can see that that tooltip text is showing up inside of this before pseudo element. And we want to make sure this only shows up when we hover over top of our button. So let's use that hover attribute. And now when we hover, you can see the text is showing up. But of course, we want to style this as an actual tooltip. So to do that, we're going to make our actual tooltip be a position of relative. And then we're going to make our tooltip that's being shown up with the before a position here of absolute. So we can position this exactly where we want. Now when we save, you can see the text is showing up like this. If we set the width to 100%, it's going to make it so that the text is all on one line, which is what we want. We can come in here with a background color. We'll just make that black a color for the actual text, which is going to be white. And we'll put a little bit of padding of 0.25 REM. Obviously this is too big. We should make this 0.25 REM and then we can see our tooltip, but it's not quite positioned where we want it to. And this is actually a little bit of a bonus tip that I'm going to show you, which is how you can position things really easily with transform. So what we want to do is make this tooltip show up at the very top of our button in the dead center. So what we can do is we could say, you know, top zero, for example, and that's going to make it so that the top portion of our tooltip lines up with the top portion of our button. But we want to go a little bit further than that. And what we want to do is say transform here. And we want to translate the Y direction by negative 100%. And when we use a percentage inside of translating, it'll actually take the height of our element and move it by 100% of its height upward. So now if we save, you can see our tooltip is moved by 100% of its height upward. And if we want to give it some spacing between our actual button, we can just make our top a negative number like negative 0.5 REM. Now if we save, you can see we have that padding between our tooltip and our button. Now to get it centered inside of our button, this is also something that's really easy to do with transform. We can set our left to 50%. That's going to make it so that the left side of our tooltip is at the dead center of our button. And then for our transform, we can just change this to a normal translate and go by negative 50% in the X direction. So it's going to move by half of its width to the left direction. And here we're moving by the entire height upwards. Now, if we save, you can see the tooltip is perfectly centered. And that's because we lined the left side up with the center of our button and then moved it over by 50% of its width, which made it dead centered inside of our button. This trick of being able to translate using percentages is incredibly useful anytime you're trying to center things or move things based on their own sizing. Translate with percentages is the only way you can do that in CSS. Now this next CSS property is one that's incredibly simple, but is going to drastically clean up your CSS and make writing complex selectors so much easier. So take for example here, we have an unordered list and inside of that we have two other lists inside of it. We have an ordered list and an unordered list. And what I want to do with my CSS is make it so that every single list that is inside of another list has all of the text inside of it of the color red. So to do that, we need to make sure we of course check for unordered list inside of unordered list, ordered list inside of unordered list, ordered list and unordered list here, and then ordered list inside of ordered list. So we have a lot of different permutations of things we need to check. And you can imagine that if we wanted to check this three levels deep, we would have even more CSS classes we would need to worry about. And it would get quite long and complicated to deal with writing out each permutation by hand. And if you need to come back and change any of these, it's a real pain to do. And that is why CSS created something called the is selector. So what I'm going to do is just write another selector that does the exact same thing right down here. And what we do is we do colon is, 
And then inside of here, we put anything that we want to check for. So we say, if this is either an unordered list or if it's an ordered list, we'll just put a comma to separate them. And then that's the first portion of our selector. So it's taking care of unordered and ordered list. Then we're gonna say, you know what, we wanna do another is selector for unordered list and ordered list. And then finally in li. This selector right here does the exact same thing as the selector up here. And if I copy in this color, and let's just make it green, for example, and I comment out this above example and save, you can see now our text has changed to green. And that's because with this is selector, it's just saying any time that we have either an unordered list or an ordered list, then followed by either an unordered list and an ordered list, followed by an li, then what we want to do is change the color to green. And if we wanted to do this for three levels deep, we would just put in another one of these like that. And it's that simple. We just change one single selector. While up here, if we wanted this to be three levels deep, we would have a whole mess of different permutations of selectors to deal with, which would be an absolute nightmare to write out by hand. While with this is selector, it is so easy to deal with. This next CSS property blew my mind when I discovered it because I really thought it was something only available in JavaScript. And that's the ability to create a counter inside of CSS. I know it sounds confusing, but let me explain. I have two different examples I'm gonna use. The first one is going to be this example of headings. And you can imagine you have an article with different headings and there are different like parts within your article and you want to specify what part they are in order without manually coming in here and saying something like part one, part two, and so on. You want the CSS to do this for you. That sounds crazy, but it's actually possible. And this is by using counters. So the way a counter works is you specify a container where that counter is going to live. So in our case, the container is going to be our body. So we can say body, and then to specify that this is where the counter is going to happen, we can say that our counter reset is going to be here, and we're gonna reset our counter, and we're just gonna name it heading. So we're saying every time we encounter the body element, reset our counter back to zero. Obviously there's only one body, so our counter is gonna start at zero at the top of our body and just keep counting up. So in order to increment our counter, we need to specify what elements we increment it on. So what we wanna do is we wanna take our H2s, we wanna get the before attribute, and inside of here we wanna take our counter, and we want to increment the heading counter. So now what's happening is we have a counter that starts at zero on our body and every H2 that we hit, it's going to increment our counter by one. So the first H2 is gonna have one, then two, then three, and so on. So now we're automatically counting our H2s in order. And the reason we're doing this in our before attribute is because I'm gonna come in here with our content and I wanna specify our content as the actual counter. So we can just call this counter function and pass it in the name, which is heading. And this is actually going to print out the content of our counter. If we click save, you can see we get one, two, and three being printed out. And if we wanna make this look a little bit better, we can put some text inside of here, such as saying part, and then we want our counter, and then of course we want a space afterwards, so we're just gonna put that space inside of here. And now you can see it says part one, if I put a space here, now it says part one, and then intro, we can even put in that colon, just like that. And you may be used to putting like pluses in between your sentences like this if you're inside of something like JavaScript. But with CSS, you just put your string, you're gonna put a space to separate it, and then your other thing, then a space and the rest to the string. And that's going to do all the concatenation for you automatically. So now you can see we have part one, part two, part three automatically being printed out by our CSS. We can even take this a step further and actually specify what we actually want our styling to be. So we could come in here and say upper Roman, and this is actually going to give us Roman numerals instead of numbers. There's a ton of different styles you can use. You can really play around with what you want, but you can specify that as a second property to counter. Now, on top of just being able to do one level of counting, you can actually do nested counters as well. If we come down here, I have an ordered list, and inside of it, I have some LIs, and then I have more ordered lists inside of it. So I just have a bunch of nesting. As you can see, we have one, two, one, two, three, one, two, four, three, four, just like this. And what I want to do is I want to make this look more like an outline. So I want this inner one to say something like 2.1. And this super inner one will say like 2.3.1 because it's keeping count of everything else around it. So we can actually do that using these counters because you can actually stack nested counters on top of each other without having issues. So we know we want our counter on these ordered lists. So we can just say ordered list and we want to reset our counter every time we get to an ordered list. And we're just going to call this outline, for example. Then whenever we reach an LI, this is where we actually want to display our counter. So we're going to use that before property inside of here so that we can say content is just going to be equal to our counter being printed out. For now, I'm just gonna leave this blank and we'll come back to it in a little bit. And here I'm gonna go counter increment for our outline. So what's going to happen is we're going to hit our OL and it's going to start our counter at zero. And then each LI we hit, it's going to increment it by one. And when we get to a new OL, what's going to happen is it's gonna start us a new counter at zero. And we can actually use both of these counters simultaneously by using a function called counters instead of counter. So here we can say counters instead of counter pass it in the thing that we want, which is our outline. And this is actually going to print it out. And we can also specify how we want to concatenate these together. So let's say we want to concatenate them all with a period in between them. Now, when I save, if we just make sure we take our LI 
and say that our list style is going to be none, that'll just get rid of these one dot two dot that are already specified by LIs by default. You can now see we have one, two, and here it says 2.1, 2.2, 2.3. Here we have 2.3.1, 2.3.2, and so on. And we can go a little bit extra with our styling by just adding in a period at the end and a space just to give us a little bit of spacing. And now you can see we have these nested styles and that's because we're using counters here instead of counter. If we were to just use counter instead of counters, you can see now that our outlines are resetting themselves every single time, kind of like a normal counter would work. But with counters, we actually get the values of all of our different counters and it concatenates them with this character in between them. So we could put whatever we want inside of here. I just have a period, you know, we can come in here with multiple periods. Now it's putting multiple periods between each one of our different counters. And this is really great if you're working with nested outlines or really any type of nesting. Now, unfortunately, this counter syntax only really works when you're specifying the content of something. You can't really use it inside of an actual width or height or color property. That would be amazing. But unfortunately, that's not something you can do in CSS. This next CSS property is one I've been waiting for for years. And that's the ability to add in gaps into Flexbox containers. It's something you can really easily do with grid. But in Flexbox, it's actually incredibly difficult to do. Normally, if you want to have a gap between your items in Flexbox, what you would do is you'd take your Flexbox container, you'd select everything that comes after it, and you'd set, you know, a margin on the right to maybe 10 pixels. As you can see, that gives us 10 pixels of space, but this last element also has 10 pixels of space on the edge, so you need to come in and actually remove that. So you would take the last child here, and what you would do is you would essentially come in here and say margin on the right is going to be zero. And it's going to remove that extra margin on the right. So now we just have a 10 pixel gap between each one of our different elements. Unfortunately, this is not the cleanest code in the entire world. It's kind of a pain to do. So luckily, they're working on adding a property to Flexbox, just like Grid, where you just say gap 10 pixels. And if we save, you can now see we have a 10 pixel gap between each element. And that is way less code and way more simple to work with than that weird syntax of having to select all the children and ignore the last child. Unfortunately though, this property is not quite supported in all browsers. If we go over and look at the can I use for this, you can see that the gap property for Flexbox is supported in most browsers. We have it in Edge, Firefox, Chrome, Opera, but the main ones that it's not supported in is Safari, and some of these more mobile browsers don't quite have it yet, so we really only have about 70% usage for this. And again, that's mostly because of Safari, Safari on iOS, and some of these other mobile browsers that don't support it. But this is something that you're going to see in the browsers very soon, and I am definitely looking forward to it because this gap syntax is so much nicer than having to deal with last child and so on. This final CSS trick is really cool because it's something you really only could do with SVG before, but now you can do it with just plain CSS. And that's the ability to do a conical gradient. Normally the only type of gradient you could do that is circle based would be a radial gradient. And that goes from the center of your object all the way to the outside of your object. As you can see in the center, it is this red color. And then it permeates outwards towards this green color as since we're going from red to green. Well, with a conic gradient, we can come in here and say conic gradient. And what that's going to do is it's going to start at the top here and it's going to go around in a circle, transitioning from red all the way to green. And then of course it has this harsh transition back to red at the start. If we wanted it to be more gradual, we would go from red to green back to red. Now, as you can see, we start at red up here, transition to green all the way down to the bottom. And then we go back towards red as we get to the top, which allows us to do these really cool kind of pie chart style things. And one really cool thing we can do with this, if I just uncomment out this code here, is we can actually do a conic gradient that's more of like a color wheel. And if we save, you can see we now have a color wheel that has all of these different colors from red, purple, blue, green, yellow, all the way back up to red. And that's really cool and all, but the most important thing about these conic gradients is the ability for you to actually create things like pie charts. So what we could do is we could say, you know what, we're going to have a red pie chart and that's going to take up, let's say 0.25 turns. And let's just comment out all this other stuff down here. Then what I want to do is have blue, and this is going to go from 0.25 turn and make sure this is turn up here. And it's going to go all the way to 0.5 turn. And then finally, we're going to have something like green and green is just going to go from 0.5 turn all the way to the very end. And now if we save, you can see that 25% of our chart is red, 25% is this blue color and 50% is green. We've created a pie chart using just really simple CSS. And depending on how complex your code is, you could obviously generate this inside of JavaScript. So you could have very fine tuned numbers for a pie chart that's super simple to write out with this conic gradient. You could use any colors you want, any type of turn radius you want. Essentially, the main thing is to determine the start and end point of all of these different things. For example, we could make this go to 0.65, start this at 0.65, and now we have our pie chart looking like this. As you can see, we can really easily create these. The main reason we don't have two numbers for red and green is because we're essentially going from 0 to 0.25 and one turn 
all the way like this. And these are just essentially values that are assumed. You assume you go all the way to the end if you only have one value and you assume you start at the beginning if you only have one value, which is why we can leave these values off when we create this pie chart. If you're looking to take your CSS skills to the next level, make sure you check out that free CSS selector cheat sheet down in the description. And if you do, I'm gonna throw in a bonus cheat sheet as well. Thank you very much for watching and have a good day.